Hello, everyone. Welcome back to class. Good to see you guys. <clears throat> Just a few seconds, actually. It got started right up at the class time today, but not to worry. So we're going to get a good lecture in today on the topic of knowledge, and we're switching into a new subject for the semester of epistemology. So that's always fun. Let me just get my notes set up really fast, and I'll be ready to go. Hi, Tina. Hi, Alicia. Good to see you guys. <clears throat> Okay, here we go. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Good to see everybody here. Welcome back to class. David, Jasmine, Emily, Angelina, Nicholas, Ruby, and all the rest. Uh, appreciate you guys being here on the last day before spring break. We're going to be able to take a little bit of a rest. Um, for about a week or so, and then we'll be back right as soon as next week is over. Um, when will I finish grading the midterms, David? Yeah, I'm gonna finish them throughout the spring break. Uh, it does take a little while to annotate and tabulate all the scores, but um, usually my ballpark estimate is no later than two weeks and usually between one and two. Um, but since we have our break next week, I would say I'm targeting no later than the day that we return. So, um, but I'll be in touch with you guys if I can finish them earlier, which I hope I can, then I'll be able to report grades in the midst of the, um, of the spring break itself. Okay. Yeah, so good question. Thank you for that. As always, anybody who has any type of questions as we go through this meeting, um, feel free to drop any comments at all. Um, and do leave behind some kind of comment at any rate whenever you have a chance for the sake of uh, attendance records and stuff. Um, yes, that's right, Spencer. So when I'm done with that, you can simply email me and I'll be able to uh, give you your score and detailed comments. With the, um, with the midterms, just like with the essays, yes, I can send you guys and I will send whoever sends me a request, um, the actual marked up exam with the scores and comments. So that'll be good. Okay, perfect. So then let's just uh, jump back into our Last lecture until we have this break. Um, so we've covered a couple of important topics in philosophy up so up till this point so far. We started with philosophy of religion, questions concerning the existence of God or the nature of God and whether we can prove or in some cases people try to disprove the existence of God. Uh, then we studied ethics for a while, right? Ethics all about the concept of morality, right and wrong, good and bad, morally permissible and impermissible. So we reviewed the major ethical theories of uh, John Stuart Mill, utilitarianism, Immanuel Kant, Kantianism. And um, <clears throat> then we also applied some of those ethical theories to the consideration of the topic, whether we have obligations to the global poor. And uh, now we finished the midterm and we're moving on to yet another topic in the semester. So as you know, philosophy has a wide variety of subjects of specialty, just like in science, there's chemistry, physics, biology. Well, in philosophy, we've only learned two major topics, philosophy of religion and ethics. Here's another one, and that's what we will spend a few weeks on. Um, well, today's meeting and then a couple of meetings after we return, we'll be on to this current new topic. And the new subject for us starting today is what's called epistemology. So epistemology, hopefully you can see the word there. This is a technical term of philosophy speak, and um, epistemology, what it means, what it refers to is the study of knowledge, the theoretical study of knowledge and ha concepts that have to do with knowledge. So, Okay, epistemology, the study of knowledge, and that's what we're all focused on for the moment. So what is knowledge, actually, and how could we possibly gain knowledge? Um, this is an ancient topic. It's been with us for a very long time, and in fact, today we're going to take a look at the writing of this ancient philosopher, um, Plato, and his teacher, Socrates. So probably you guys have heard those names before. I think it doesn't necessarily take a philosophy uh, major to have heard just these historic figures' names at least a couple times in your life. 
Um, so when you take a philosophy class, probably you just assume at some point we'll learn something about those old guys from Greece, Socrates and Plato. And now we have come to that point. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today just about some history at first. I want to talk to you about what is uh, the life and times of Socrates and Plato. And then um, from there, we'll start to just basically build up a vocabulary to talk about the concept of knowledge. Um, the first written accounts of what knowledge is trace back thousands of years to the days of ancient Greece when Socrates and Plato wrote and discussed knowledge. And um, this is a field of study that has continued through to the current day. Many current day philosophers study epistemology as their primary study. And in fact, me, I am one of those epistemologists. So I kind of come to this topic with special interest because my subject of focus when I was in grad school getting my PhD was epistemology. So like I wrote a dissertation about disagreement between people and what significance or impact that has for your knowledge. Like when someone that you respect does not agree with you, does that mean that you don't know because the, they've defeated your knowledge or not? So um, I'm a big fan of epistemology. I like all the topics in philosophy, but this one was kind of my special focus. And, um, you know, I worked with really good dissertation advisor who I believe is maybe the world's leading epistemologist that's alive right now. This guy Sven Berniger. So anyway, I'm just saying that as a sort of sidebar to let you guys know that um, I come to the subject of epistemology with even more interest and um, special knowledge than maybe of some of the other class topics, but I'm pretty good at all of them, I guess. And then, you know, you got Peach over here. Good girl. Peachy's a sweet cat. Okay, so um, let me start off then with this. I said to you that I wanted to tell you a little bit about the ancient Greeks so that you have a context and that you have some kind of background knowledge about their lives and the history there. So let me give you the dates, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about two important men, um, Socrates and Plato. Okay? So give me a second while I get my notes to that. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So <clears throat> two important Greek figures, Socrates and Plato. So I'm going to put their dates of life up here on the board. <laughs> okay, so first of all, you see the definition of epistemology, the study of knowledge. I can clear that away and create some more room now for the names and dates of life for Socrates and Plato. So come on, Peach. There we go. Hmm? Whoa. She's too, she's too much. She's a handful, but she's a good cat. Okay, so we're learning about Socrates and Plato, guys. A little crash course in history. Now, people study these guys in much detail. So you could spend the whole semester just reading the works of Plato or of Socrates. So what I'm going to be talking about now is this very, you know, uh, sort of general overview, skipping some details, but I want to give you the basic facts. So one man is Socrates, and then you've also got Plato. The selection that we're going to read today was written by Plato, but a long, long, long time ago, 469 to 399 BC. All right. Before the Common Era. So that's not 469 AD, like the 5th century. This is 469 years before year zero. You know, so like 400, almost 500 years before the life and times of Jesus Christ and the early Bible stories. So this is way back in the past, right? We're talking 2,400 years ago. That's the time that he lived on. And that's why the date of his birth is a bigger number than the date or the year where he died, because, you know, as he's getting older, we're approaching um, year zero in the in the Julian calendar. So he lived 70 years. He's from Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece is widely considered to be kind of like the cradle of Western civilization. Um, and so he's kind of widely recognized as the forefather, kind of like the granddaddy grandfather figure of Western philosophy. So we owe, you know, a lot of uh, important debt of gratitude to Socrates for having lived and wrote um, well, he didn't write, but he spoke, and other people wrote down the things that he, that he said. So we're going to learn a little bit more about him, but I'm just starting off with his name and the dates that he lived. Now, Plato was a student of Socrates. So it's like Socrates was the teacher. Plato was his student or his disciple. So he's a little younger than Socrates in terms of when he was born. 
his lifespan was from 428 BC until 3, 347. Okay, so just showing you there the different dates that their lives spanned across. So, you know, Socrates was born in 469. 41 years into his life, Plato was born. So he's a couple generations older than, um, than Plato, right? 41 years old when this man was born. And Plato lived on for a significant amount of time longer than Socrates. So Socrates passed away in 399. Plato is still there until 347, so about 50 more years of life. Okay, so um, let me talk to you guys a little bit about Socrates. If you take an intro to philosophy class and you don't learn a little bit about him, I feel like that would be dereliction of duty. Right? You need to know something about these historic forefathers of philosophy. So let's start with Socrates, okay? The time is, you know, like 400 and something BC. Um, and the place is Athens, Greece. Now imagine this. This is an ancient time. This is thousands of years ago. So we obviously don't have any modernism, industrialization. You just have people living, working, and... Um, engaging in commerce. There was a town square in Athens. The town square would be like the equivalent of like your modern day downtown area where a lot of people would go um, barter and trade. Sometimes you would see people um, engaged in performance art. Sometimes people are just having conversations. So it'd be like this big bustling kind of market square in the downtown of Athens. Now Socrates, at this point in his life, he's already kind of an older guy. And he's developed a reputation among the community of Athens for being this brilliant conversationalist. And what he would do is he would go to that town square of Athens, just set up down there and hang out. And he would engage people in conversation uh, from all different walks of life and from all different backgrounds. And he had this amazing skill of having very intellectual conversations with people where he would actually shape their opinions a little bit or at least reveal to them that they didn't have some knowledge that they came into the conversation thinking that they had. So he was kind of famous for, through a critical process of question and answer, leading people gently from their initial assumptions towards totally new realizations. In many cases, people enter a conversation with Socrates, they think they have a point of view on something, and then by the time the discussion is over with, they leave from that conversation with their mind completely flipped 180. Like they now reject their previous viewpoint, or they no longer at least claim the certainty that they thought they had before. So he was really great at opening minds, changing people's perspectives, getting them to look at things differently. And um, he was so well known for that, that he developed this big reputation in Athens as, you know, this guy that everyone could go and talk to, and he had a lot of wisdom. There was actually a word that was developed about Socrates. This is an old Greek word that kind of um, is used to give a phrase to his classical method of questioning and answering. So his dialogue, his back and forth dialogue method, they call that the uh, elenchus. Okay, so here's the word elenchus. E-L-E-N-C-H-U-S. The Greek word elenchus, that just stands for Socrates' method of critical Q&A, question and answer. So, Elenchus, Socrates' method. Today, we sometimes in the academy call it the Socratic method, named after Socrates, Socratic. And um, that's what he would do. As an example, right, I told you that he would talk to people of all different backgrounds. So sometimes people high up in the Athenian government, sometimes members of the military, and sometimes just everyday folk and fellow you know, citizens. In one case, he was talking to this, um, this Greek general, you know, from the Greek military, and he asks the guy, excuse me, tell me what do you think is justice? What is justice according to you, sir? And the guy was like, oh, well, you know, he's a, he's a general and he had a kind of cynical view about all that. So what he said is, I think it's just might makes right. You know, what is justice but power? Whoever has more power, they get to decide what so-called justice is. And then by the time, you know, Socrates gets through with that person through this gentle Q&A, the person exits the conversation saying something like, oh, never mind, Socrates, I was wrong. Now through our conversation, I realized differently that justice has to do with acting honorably according to virtue or whatever. So it was an impressive skill, this ability to shape views, change minds, 
and um, open minds. So he was very well known for that. And because of that, he was kind of a little bit um, famous in the local area. And he had a group of followers that would just go and listen to him talk because they thought it was very interesting to hear his conversations with people. In fact, there was a group of young men, um, a couple generations younger than him, that would just go and like listen to him to learn lessons about life and um, about the world. So people would actually sit back and just kind of check out him talking to others. And so he had a group of like loyal followers that were younger men. One of those was Plato. Okay, so Plato kind of was within that set of younger uh, followers of Socrates that were really impressed with him. Why were they so impressed? Because they thought it was cool that he was willing to challenge um, tradition and received wisdom. And they thought that it was cool that he was willing to take on the opinions and views of their parents and their elders and the authority figures of Athens. So they thought it was inspiring and impressive. Uh, that's why they wanted to listen to him and learn from him. Okay, good to see you, Summer and Janet and all the rest. Hi, hi guys. I'm just talking to you today a little bit to start the meeting about the life and times of Socrates, the great ancient Greek forefather of philosophy. Okay, and where I'm at now is just explaining that he would go to the town square of Athens, engage people in conversation. He became kind of famous for that, and he had a group of young followers that would set up and listen to him, including Plato. Now, <clears throat> y'all still follow me? Just making sure we're all still together. Little history lesson. Okay, so not everybody liked Socrates, though. As popular as he might have been with some of these young folks that listened to him and thought he was inspiring, some people were a little skeptical of him and they were thinking, I don't know, Socrates, we think he might be a bad influence on our young people. So some of the members of the Athenian government were concerned, or at least they said they were concerned, about Socrates' influence. They thought, you know, with what he does in the town square, talking to people and opening minds and all of that, maybe he's causing some people to be too open-minded. Like maybe these young people are listening to Socrates and they're going to start rebelling against what we teach them in school or what their parents tell them. Maybe he's getting them to no longer believe in the Greek gods, you know? So we're worried that he's having this kind of subversive influence on our youth. And we need him to stop doing whatever he's doing where he calls it philosophy, because again, they thought he was corrupting the youth. So you kind of understand the state of play. There's these young folks and a lot of other members of Athenian society that really liked Socrates and they thought what he was doing was valuable and then added to the life and culture of Athens. But then there were some members of the government that had a much more cynical viewpoint on it and they thought, uh, you know what, he's probably corrupting the youth and his influence on them is a negative one. So we want him to stop and we want to somehow pressure him into stopping his conversationalist style in the town square. So they sent down a messenger from the government to speak to Socrates. Now, Jasmine, here's what you've said. I know he has a famous quote. Uh, I know that I'm intelligent because I know that I know nothing. Oh, yes, I'll tell you just right. Uh, I'll tell you about that. So very good reference. He did say that. The quote, I believe, is, is something like, um, I'm the wisest of all because I know that I know nothing. And um, yes, I will come right back to that. But let me just say a few more things and then we'll come, we'll circle back to it, but good question. So thank you, Jasmine. Um, yeah, like, so I was saying that he had some people in the Athenian government that wanted to shut him down because they were, you know, claiming that he was a bad influence on the youth. So they sent a messenger out to Socrates and the messenger says this to him. Okay, Socrates, look, I'm from the Athenian government and here's the rules or here's what we want you to do anyway. We need you to stop this stuff. You're calling it philosophy, whatever it is, it needs to stop because we think that you're corrupting the youth. They're no longer going to listen to anybody. They're going to be thinking too outside the box, and they might not even believe in the Greek gods anymore. We, we can't have that. So we're just telling you right now, it needs to stop. And if it doesn't stop, if you keep doing this, we're going to press charges against you and arrest you, okay? So that's the deal. That's an ultimatum. It's either stop doing this philosophy or, you know, we will come back and we'll press charges and you're going to get arrested. So now Socrates, he completely rejects this. He says that is fundamentally wrong. I'm not doing anything bad. This is a good thing for Athens and for everybody that's a part of it. No way am I hurting anyone and I'm not ch challenging the Greek gods far from it because Socrates believes in them too. He said, this is all just bogus and completely made up. These are false fake allegations that I'm doing harm. So I, I don't agree. And therefore he continued just doing the same thing, right? Continued practicing philosophy, talking to people and having these conversations and dialogues. So, of course, right, the Athenian government, they didn't like this, so they made good on their threat. They came back and they arrested him. Now, um, 
here's something I want to mention as we're talking about this history. How do we know all this stuff about Socrates? Well, you might be uh, surprised to learn that he himself never wrote anything down. He, he never wrote a single word. How do we know all this stuff? Because other people wrote down the accounts of what he did. And Plato, his student, is the number one reason that we have so much uh, facts and information about the life and writings, well, not writings, but teachings of Socrates. Um, so if not for Plato, much of this stuff would have been lost forever. But Plato has a whole series of writings, and those writings are academically referred to as Plato's dialogues. Okay, The Platonic dialogues are called this because the writing format is almost like a play. We have characters that kind of read off lines in the play. And the main character in most of the Platonic dialogues is his teacher, Socrates. So if we want a window into the lifetimes and ideas and teachings of Socrates, the only place we can look are the writings of Plato, which have survived. And um, that's why we have it today. Now, um, scholars and historians, philosophers too, sometimes debate amongst themselves how much of the Socrates that appears in these pages of the Platonic writings is the real historical Socrates and how much of it is a little embellished or whatever, or how much of it is Plato himself just using his teacher as like a figurehead for the expression of his own views and ideas. Well, obviously, um, you know, there's always going to be some debate over that because we can't uh, compare like some other records against the Platonic writings themselves. But we do know for a fact that Socrates is a real life historical figure. In fact, some say that there's more um, direct evidence that he was a human being, a flesh and blood person, than even, you know, like religious figures such as Jesus Christ or whoever. Uh, because um, we have some of the, content, the the court records from the time period of when he was put on trial. And there was also a playwright at the time whose name was <clears throat> Aristophanes. And Aristophanes wrote a play called The Clouds, which includes Socrates as one of the characters. So he was a well-known figure at the time of Athens, and there are other records that also attest to the events of his life. But anyway, in these Platonic writings, dialogues that they are called, we learn various events, teachings, etc., of Socrates. And one of the Platonic dialogues is called the Apology. I'm just going to write that here on the board really fast, because the Apology is the dialogue of Plato, which discusses the trial of Socrates at, in the Athenian court system. Now, it's kind of an ironic title, because Apology makes it sound like someone's saying sorry, right? But Socrates is far from apologetic. You know, he's defiant to the very last, because he finds it completely a perversion of justice, a miscarriage of justice, that he's even being arrested in the first place. So if you ever do want to, and someday you might you know, find interest in further studies in philosophy, or you might want to follow up on the ancient Greeks, and if you do that, you could read the Apology and get a much more detailed written account of the things I'm describing now from the trial. But now we're talking about the trial, okay? So if you're following this little lesson of history, I started by just telling you about the things that Socrates did, which ultimately led to his arrest, and um, now let's say he's on trial. So he's on trial, and um, in the ancient Athens society, there was a criminal justice system, which had a, a, a jury trial system as well, kind of like an ancient ancestor of our modern um, you know, jury system. But the difference is that in our modern American uh, criminal justice system, as you know, it's 12 uh, people that are paneled onto a jur jury. But in Athens, <clears throat> they would actually have widespread participation by all the eligible adult male citizens. So it wouldn't have been like 12 people uh, passing judgment on the accused. You would have hundreds and hundreds of adult male citizens in like big auditorium gallery style seating. So it's a very large jury and it's community wide. So uh, it's like everyone's a part of it basically that they're an adult male back then. That's the standard. Okay, so he's on trial. And um, <clears throat> the rules of proceedings back then were this. The Athenian government gets to make their case why he's guilty, and then he gets to make his defense. And um, at the end, after both sides' arguments were made, the accused person was given an opportunity to propose a counter penalty. Okay, now let me explain this concept of counter penalty. This would normally be the point where the accused would go before the court and say, okay, gentlemen of the jury and court, um, I'm innocent, like I've argued. But if you find me guilty anyway, if your judgment is that I am guilty, then I would humbly request a lesser punishment than what the state has suggested. 
Okay, so normally this would be the person that's accused. They would suggest a lesser penalty than the official one given by the state so that in the event of a guilty verdict, the jury might decide to lower the penalty a little bit. Okay, so like imagine that the, the state was trying to prosecute someone and they wanted to get 10 years of forced labor in like a labor camp as punishment. Maybe the accused would go in front of the jury then and say, now my proposal, because I think that is a little excessive compared to the nature of the accusation, would be not 10 years, but something lighter than that, maybe five, right? So normally you'd want to sort of appeal to the uh, sympathy of the jury, but still show that you would offer a penalty that's substantial enough to be merited. Now Socrates gets up there. And he has his chance to speak to the jury and propose the counter penalty. And here's how that went, which is also, again, written in the apology. He says, okay, everyone on the jury, you've heard the, uh, you've heard the arguments. The Athenian government says that I'm corrupting the youth. And what they're proposing is that if I'm guilty, that I should be executed, death penalty. Well, that's definitely the worst penalty you can have. And that's a little bit too much. And like I said, I'm innocent. I've in no way corrupted the youth. That's totally false. So I should be found innocent. But if you don't think I'm innocent and I have to suggest some other penalty, let me think about it. What would be a good penalty for someone according to the crimes that I've been accused of? So death, that's too much. That's too heavy. Let's lower it a little bit. So if you guys find me guilty, how about this? Instead of death, I think something that fits more with the nature of what I did, my so-called crime. How about not death, but rather, wait for it, free lunch for the rest of my whole life at the cafeteria of heroes down in Athens. Because I don't think you've been paying attention. You see, you punish someone when they did something bad. But me teaching philosophy is good, and it's only good, and it's good for everybody. So what should I? What do I deserve? You want to quote unquote punish me? How about punish me with free lunch for life? Because I, that's what I deserve from the record of my good conduct, right? So you guys follow what he just said? I mean, that's not a penalty, right? Free lunch for life is a reward. And it's not just free lunch anywhere. It's at like the cafeteria of like celebrated heroes, war heroes and stuff of Athens. So he's saying, I deserve to be put up there as a hero of Athens if you really want to get down to it. So I don't deserve no death penalty. If you guys thought I was guilty, ha ha, how about punish me with free lunch forever? Now, you know, so what he's doing there is he's defiantly saying, I don't deserve any punishment. You know, even if you ask me to give a substitute punishment, I would say, give me free lunch because... This is all terrible and wrong. I shouldn't be being even accused of a crime here. So he dismissively rejects the whole proceedings and the jury goes back, deliberates, and they return the decision that they thought he was guilty. So they convicted him. Now he's been convicted of whatever corrupting the youth. And so he's now going to be sentenced to die, to be executed. But the story's not quite over yet. Okay. Just there's a few more steps. So after that, he's you know, taken down to the chambers where he's going to be held. And um, <clears throat> they had a belief back then in Athens, okay? This was kind of like a superstitious cultural belief, but they did believe this, that if you had a cargo ship that was out to sea at the time that there was a accused person convicted of death, convicted was sentenced to death, right? If there was a ship out at sea from Athens, they believed that you had to wait for the ship to return home safely first before you do the execution because they thought that if you didn't do that, you might upset the gods or something, and then the gods would show their wrath by causing that ship to sink. So, as it happened, there actually was a ship out on a mission, and that happened before Socrates was convicted. So they said, let's wait. we got to wait for it to come back. We don't want to make the gods mad at us with that ship out there in the ocean. So there's about a week that they had to wait for the ship to return, and Socrates would just be held in a chamber for the time period, awaiting the return of the ship so they could execute him in a way that they thought would not be upsetting to the Greek gods. Yeah. Okay, so that gives them a little window of time before the execution date. Now, in that one week or whatever time period, one night, late at night, um, in the deep, dark middle of the night, who comes into his chamber, but he sees it's that group of young guys, including Plato, okay? And they've snuck into his chambers where he's being held, under cover of night and doing so secretly, maybe bribing some of the guards. And now they have a word with Socrates, okay? So um, this event, by the way, this like, uh, well, I don't know if I want to spoil the spoiler or whatever, but this event that I'm describing where they come down into his chambers and try to get him out, 
that's another platonic dialogue. If you ever want to read it, that's called uh, the Crito. So anyway, those that are knowledgeable about the ancient Greek works, Crito is where we discuss or where it's written about this interaction with the young guys in Socrates. Okay, so anyway, they're down there, and here's what they said to him. They say, Socrates, come on. Look, we don't have a lot of time. You can see that we snuck down here, and um, we bribed some guards and everything, so we have a few moments free. But we're trying to get you out of here. You know, you're being held uh, down here in this dungeon, and they're going to execute you. And everyone knows it's wrong. I mean, all of us young people that have been following you, um, it's totally a, it's an atrocity for them to want to execute you. You know, you're like a light of Athens. I mean, you're a great man, and there's no way that's fair and right. So here's the deal. We've come with these chariots, and we want you to come with us, and we're going to get you out of here. We're going to take you far away from Athens so that you can continue to do the things that you love and that are so great for everyone, philosophy, right? Um, come on, then. Let's go. So that's what they say to Socrates. Now, what do you think is the next point in this narrative? Did he go or not go? What would be your guess? Socrates says, fine, let's do this. Or, no, I'm not going. What do you think? <clears throat> That's right, Jasmine. He didn't go. He said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go with you guys. Um, why not? Why would you think he wouldn't go? Well, I'll explain his thoughts. He said, um, First of all, I really appreciate that you guys would be willing to break me out of prison. Um, and by the way, I totally agree with you. Is this right? Is this fair? No, it's totally unfair. It's unjust. It's a corrupt thing. I don't deserve to be punished this way, especially when I've lived a good life. I mean, he was a member of the Athenian military. He had kids in Athens. And he says that to them. He says, here's the thing, though. I don't want to live my life as a fugitive. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder forever for the rest of my life, wondering, worrying, are they coming to get me? Am I going to be captured today? He's 70 years old, by the way, at this point. And so he's pretty old. And he says, you know, I've lived a long life. I don't want to live as a fugitive. Also, he says, I just don't want to leave Athens. He loves Athens. And he says, as much as I disagree with this verdict, I still love the country and I still love Athens itself. And um, Athens has given everything to me. It's given me my family, my, my life and everything and my kids. So I don't want to live in exile. I don't want to be a person who's far away from my, my home. And then he also says, um, you know, he believes in the immortality of the soul. So he doesn't think that he's really risking much. He says, you know, if I'm executed, then my soul will just go up into the heavens with the heavenly forms and I'll be there for eternity. So I'm not even worried about this punishment. Um, and he also says, look, as much as I don't agree with the verdict, um, I don't want to be a rebel or an anarchist who just says when you don't agree with the results of the criminal justice system, then you just could break the law. So he says, out of principle, out of just pure principle and respect for Athens, I'm going to take this penalty um, because, I, again, I don't want to live as a fugitive. I don't want to disrespect the criminal justice system. And my whole life is bound up with Athens, and that's where I want to, that's where I want to die. So... They, they try to compel him. They try to just say, come on, Socrates. This is just so wrong. Just come with us. And he just won't budge. So he respectfully declines. Okay. So then, um, you know, that's it. He won't leave. And therefore, the, the next day, the ship returns. The ship returns from the mission that it was on. And, um, and now they're prepared to do their execution. So they do. And the method was for him to take poison. So he drank this hemlock poison. And that just shuts down his body and he dies. Now, there's a famous painting called The Death of Socrates. And um, in the painting, you see him reclining on a table. And he's encircled by all these young guys that are his followers, including Plato. And in the painting, this is like a Renaissance classic painting. Socrates is pointing up at the sky. And people, you know, it's art, right? So everything is symbolic. Um, what is the significance of the gesture pointing? It could be that he's saying, um, keep pursuing the higher truth. Um, after I'm gone, or he might be saying, you know, my soul is going to go up into the heavens, whatever, but that's it. Socrates then passes on, and um, Plato carries the torch forward after that. So Plato becomes a bit older, and he founds the first institution of higher learning in the Western world, which was just called Plato's Academy. That Plato's Academy is kind of like the ancient Greek ancestor of our modern university system. And he, in turn, has a student that's a few generations younger than him, and that's Aristotle. So Aristotle becomes like the star student of Plato, 
he graduates from the academy and then he becomes this major philosophical figure in the West. And in turn, he becomes a tutor to Alexander the Great. And then Alexander the Great conquers a whole bunch of lands and even more widely disseminates the Greek thought. And then, you know, here it is thousands of years later today and we're still talking about Socrates, such, such was his impact on the world. So um, when I look back at that sequence of events, you know, culminating in his death, I think sometimes about what was the purpose of him not leaving and escaping with the, with the young guys. And I guess in one way, you can almost say that it makes him stand out as a martyr-like figure for the establishment of Western philosophy. Had he escaped, he would have become a common fugitive of justice and maybe just relegated to the sidelines of history. But I think it makes a more forceful point uh, that resonates a little more that he was so committed to his way of working and uh, his methodology that he would rather die um, than to sort of forsake the value of it by committing a criminal act. So that's the uh, life and times of Socrates. Now that's just a little bit of a backstory. Today, I told you that we're gonna start learning about epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge and what knowledge is. And so the first ancient account of this is one of the dialogues of Plato and um, it's called the Mino. So I'm gonna erase this here. And now we're gonna just at least get started trying to break down some of the ideas that are found in Plato's writing called the Mino. <clears throat> so the article is called the Mino, the dialogue is called the Mino, and it's written by Plato, who I just showed you his dates of life, thousands of years old. So Mino is the name of this Greek general, and um, he, in this dialogue, is having a conversation with Socrates. So the dialogue Mino is a discussion piece, conversation between those two people in this story, Mino the general versus with Socrates. Now I'm going to talk all about the uh, details of Mino. Um, but first thing I have to do, though, before I get into it, is give you guys a little bit of a basic vocabulary on some epistemology terminology. Um, only by knowing some of these pieces of terminology can we really fully digest the writings uh, that we're going to now look at. So hold in mind that we're going to speak about the Mino in a moment. But I do have to first preview it with some basic vocabulary items. So here we go. Let's call this epistemology vocabulary. <clears throat> <clears throat> so these are just key terms and words that you would probably have to know or be at least somewhat familiar with to dive into studies on epistemology and writings in this field. Okay, so let's get started with one major concept in epistemology, which is the word truth. Now, um, what do you think the word truth means? What does it take for a sentence? Well, hold on. Actually... I'm going a little out of order. I wanted to do proposition first. Sorry. We'll get to truth next. Okay, so just hold that thought. Proposition. Now, this one, I don't think you're going to have the understanding until I teach it to you, so I'm just going to tell you first of all. The word proposition in its philosophic usage is the meaning behind a sentence, the meaning of a sentence. Okay, so proposition, the meaning of a sentence. Proposition, the meaning of a sentence. <clears throat> so you might look at that and say, well, how is the meaning of a sentence different from the sentence itself? Well, there can actually be a difference there. In fact, you can have multiple sentences with the same meaning. Okay, so here's an example of that. For example, look at the sentence here. It's written in English, and it's just going to say the snow is white. The snow is white. All right, no problem. Hopefully that's clear and easy to understand. I'm going to write another sentence below here. And this second sentence, uh, I'm going to write it in a different language. But I'm going to ask you to guess what you think it means. So the second one here below this says, Der Schnee ist weiß. Okay, Schnee, I mean, I don't know if it's easy enough to read S-C-H-N-E-E. -E. But anyway, this is German. 
Der Stay ist weiß. Now, there's two sentences here. That much we know because you see that there's two and they're not in the same spelling. So they're not identical even in terms of how they sound or look. But although there are two sentences of writing there, how many propositions do you think that there are between these two sentences? That's the question. If you're following the definition of proposition, then see if you can answer my question. How many propositions are on this board right here? Just one. That is right. Correct. So now if you, you gave me the right answer. So if, could you explain that? Why is it that you say they are the, there's only one proposition? Because, I mean, there are two sentences. So how, come, how could it be that there's only one proposition? Tell me if you can. I think, you'll, I think you understand why. But I'd like to see you put it there first. <clears throat> so yeah, what is the reason that that's the correct answer, that it's just one proposition? The meaning is the same. That is correct. Yes. They mean the same thing. So they're not saying different information. The snow is white, der Schnee ist weiß. In German, it sounds different. It looks a little different visually, but it is the same exact information, just in two separate languages. Even in one and the same language, we can have two separate sentences which convey the same information. Just take the difference between the active and the passive voice. I could say, uh, I am your professor, or I could say, you are my student. I mean, in a way, these things are equivalent. Um, or I could say, I am in my kitchen, or another option would be, the kitchen is where I am. Those are two different sentences, but they say the same exact information, so they convey the same propositional content. Okay, so a proposition is the meaning behind the outward form of words or speech that we hear or see. Um, We know that there are many different languages in the world which can carry across the same information by means of different symbols or different sounds. So the unit of meaning is the proposition itself, which is then cloaked in the outward form of words that are either symbolically written in inscriptions or spoken as auditory sounds that you hear. Okay, so that's one point to remember as we start this discussion of vocabulary. A proposition is just the meaning of a sentence. And why have we started with that? Because it is propositions which are the objects of knowledge. It is a proposition which either one knows or does not know. Okay, so take the proposition that the earth is round. That is a proposition, and it's something that one could either know or not know, depending on their individual case. Okay, so proposition meaning of a sentence, and that's distinct from the sentence itself, because as seen here, multiple sentences can have the same propositional content. Okay. So we're going on to the next vocabulary term. <clears throat> the next one is the word truth. So now we can get into it. Now, truth, it's interesting. It's such a fundamental concept, and it's so um, broadly spoken of all the time. You know, like we talk about, did that really happen, or was that even, was that fake? You know, so we, we always distinguish between, like, reality and fiction, truth and lies, Well, what do you think it means for a, for a proposition to be true? If you had to try and define that, what do you think that definition would be? What's the difference between a proposition being a true proposition as opposed to a false one? Because not all propositions are true. Like if I say to you that uh, I'm wearing a hat, that's a false proposition because right now I'm not wearing one. But if I say that I'm wearing glasses, that is true because as you can see, that that is a fact. So what is the difference between a true proposition and a false one? What makes it have the status that it's one of those that are true? You say it's correct or it's wrong? That's okay, David. But here's the thing about this definition that's hard to get out at first, because your first attempt is sort of circular. You know, because if you just say that a true proposition is something that's correct, correct, we can ask the same question. What does it mean for it to be correct? So it's just kind of like a synonym, and it sort of starts to sound like it's true because it's true. But that's not a problem with your answer. That's a very common way of trying to formulate the answer because you're grasping for something other than the word itself. Now, Jasmine, no. I got to just say straight up no. You say that it has to have evidence for it in order to be correct. And here's the thing. A lot of times you have evidence, and evidence gives you a reason to think something is true, yes. But it's also possible for something to be true and no one to have any evidence of it at all, okay? So, like, for example... Take hypothetically that someone has committed murder and they committed this murder and then they hid the body somewhere where no one ever found it. And then suppose the murderer has passed away. So there's not even one person on the whole planet that knows where this body is. 
maybe nobody even knows what happened to the person. Maybe they thought they could have committed suicide or fallen into the ocean accidentally or something might have happened and no one knows about it. Couldn't it still be true though that they're buried in the desert even if nobody has evidence? You understand? And so, Jasmine, I hope that makes sense to you. Certainly there could be things that are true that no one has discovered yet or that nobody has any proof of. When you have the proof, you have reasons to think something's true. And that's good. And you need to have such reasons to have knowledge. But things can be true even if no one is aware of them. And so, Alan, the way you're putting it is good. And I like that. Truth is factual. And good. Thanks, Jasmine, for your, for your feedback. So truth is factual. Now we're getting to the right conception. Having this little discussion, now I think I'm ready to state the definition in full. So truth is simply a match between what the proposition says and then what the facts in reality are. So it's when what the proposition says matches the facts of reality. That's true. Okay, so when whatever the proposition says, what it, the content of it is, matches the facts, then that's a true proposition. Okay, so like, if I'm telling you that I'm wearing a watch, I'm speaking the truth, because it's not just me saying it, it's really a fact, and you can see that on my wrist. But if I say to you right now that I'm wearing um, a blazer, I'm just wearing a basic t-shirt, so me saying I'm wearing a blazer would be speaking something false. So statements, people can make statements of whatever kind but they're only true statements if they mirror or match reality. Okay, say that someone cheated on, on their partner and then they are asked, have you ever cheated? And they say, no, I haven't. That would not be true in that example because they're saying they didn't, but in reality they did. So statements have to match the real world facts to be true. Whether we can discover what's true or not is a separate question, but just that things are true has to do with the comparison between a piece of information and then real reality. Okay, so if I say to you that um, the moon orbits the planet Earth, I say something true because that's what's really going on out there. And if I say that the Earth orbits, or sorry, if I say the sun orbits the Earth, that would be false because as you know, the solar system, the planets rotate around the sun, not the other way around. So um, anyway, guys, truth. When what the sentence says matches the facts of reality. If I told you that I was uh, 10 feet tall, it's certainly a falsehood. That's a false statement. Now, sometimes when we pass on information, we pass on false information without knowing it. Sometimes that's because we don't know the facts ourselves. Suppose someone relayed something to you, but they were misinformed. And then you pass that same claim on to somebody else, you'd misinform that other person. But that might not be because you're trying to lie. It might just be because you're relying on false information yourself. In other cases, we deceive people because we want them to not know what's true. So like that would be the case of lying to cover up bad behavior or lying about you know, something that you did so that you don't get discovered. Okay, so anyway guys, truth. We've talked about two pieces of terminology with respect to epistemology. Proposition, it's just the content or meaning of a sentence, and then truth, when one proposition matches the real facts of reality. Okay, so we continue from here. The next term to cover is belief. And I'm doing this in a specific order actually because each new definition kind of relies on something from the past one. So you really can't describe what truth is until you know what a proposition is, because it is these propositions that you would compare to reality to determine if they're true or not. The word belief also piggybacks off of the word truth, because to say what a belief is, truth is one of the words in the definition. So now let's go there and try and get that out. What do you think the word belief refers to? What is it for a person to have a belief? in a proposition. So like if you believe that um, the planet is round, or if you believe that, you know, um, <clears throat> let's see, that there's a Sasquatch, or if, if you believe that God exists, or if you believe that um, there's life in outer space, what does it mean to believe a statement? And I gave you a kind of hint because I said the word truth is involved in the definition. So let's see if we can try and guess on that. <clears throat> Just waiting for your response real fast, but don't leave me hanging too long. What do you think? 
you know, the word belief. <clears throat> two people can have two different beliefs, right? One person can say, I, I believe this guy is the murderer. And the other juror can say, no, I don't believe that is true. I don't think that person's the murderer. So what is it to believe a statement? Okay, good, David. When you say, when you agree with the truth, that's, I guess, one way to put it. Yeah, I would put it this way, similar. Um, when the person thinks, thinks that the statement is true, or as you say, when you agree with whatever the statement says, that is believing it. Okay, so very good. Belief. When, it, when an individual, when a person thinks a proposition is true, that's when you believe it. Okay, so beliefs are just your views about what is true and what's not. And with beliefs, we can have different beliefs, and, you know, oftentimes we do. Suppose I believe that there are aliens out there somewhere in space, and suppose there's another person who says, no way, you know, God wouldn't have done that or something, you know, he created us in his image. So that person says, I don't think so. I don't believe there are. So the one statement, there's aliens, we don't agree. I think that's a mirror of reality. I think that in real reality that, that that's the case. The other person thinks that that's a statement, but it doesn't match anything real. So we just don't agree, perhaps, on that case. Or the belief in God, right, that God exists, another clear belief that divides people um, all around, you know. Many people, perhaps most, uh, take the statement God exists to be true. They think, yes, it's not just a made-up thing. There's something real there. And then there are atheists and skeptics that say, I don't think there is such a belief, or sorry, I don't think there is such a being as God, so they would say, I don't believe the statement that God exists is true. Um, and other things, of course, you know, in everyday society, policies, positions, um, one person can think, oh, a wall is an effective immigration control method. Another person can say, no, it is not. That's not true. Um, so anyways, guys, beliefs are kind of up to you, the judge of, of facts. You know, you're the person who decides on what you think is true, of course. No one else can set your beliefs for you. Uh, but there's only one reality. Okay, so suppose we have one person that thinks the earth is flat and another person who says, I believe it's round. They can have their different beliefs but they cannot both be correct because there's just one planet and it doesn't have two shapes. So in the end, with us human beings forming our beliefs, we would hope that in the best case scenario, our beliefs will be mostly true. Because if they're true, that means that you're connected to reality and you understand what's happening in it. If you have a head full of false beliefs though, like take people full of you know conspiracy theories, QAnon, you know, no moon landing, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff out there that are false. If you have a head full of false beliefs, this is not good for you because by definition of truth and falsity, that means that you're disconnected from reality. Like you think things are happening in the world, but they're not actually happening. So that's no way to live. Um, part of the value of being a good critical thinker, thinking philosophically, logically, is that you're a better judge of truth and falsehood. And so you're going to have a better appreciation of fact and, and uh, of objectivity. And that doesn't mean that we'll ever be perfect at that. That doesn't mean that you'll never make mistakes and you'll never even have one false belief. Of course... There's any number of reasons why we can be misinformed, deceived, et cetera. Um, our judgment can lapse in some cases due to other cognitive and non-cognitive factors. But um, trying our best to at least form true beliefs is the goal. Okay, now one of a couple more terms. We said truth. We said belief. Now I have to ask about another one, and that's justification. <clears throat> What do you think is to say a person has a justified belief? Okay, so that's a new concept to add to our vocabulary here. So say someone has a belief and we, we can describe it as being justified. What do you think is the difference between a justified belief and another belief that is not justified? So maybe this word has some resonance to you or something that you can relate to. What is the difference maker between a belief that is justified versus one that is unjustified? What do you think would make a belief a justified one? So what is justification? Okay, I'm looking at your suggestions here. A reason to support your belief or evidence. That's very good. And the same to you, Derek. Correct. Exactly. So as you guys have put it, justification is just when you have good reasons or evidence to support your belief to back it up you have something to back yourself up with and you not just shrug your shoulders if someone says why though 
right? So that's what justification is. Um, having good reasons or um, evidence. So I'll just put evidence slash reasons because it's kind of the same. Um, to support your belief. Okay, so um, that's what it is for a belief to be justified. Suppose that someone, you know, says to their partner, I think you've been cheating on me. They're like, no way, I haven't done that. They're like, well, come on. I mean, look, I looked at your phone. And I'm seeing on your phone all these messages to somebody who I don't recognize. So, you know, I have evidence, actually, that you've been cheating. Or, you know, also, I've noticed um, you got, like, lipstick and stuff on your collar. Where did that come from? So now I have reasons. I have reasons to think this is true. I'm not just saying it off of the top with no backing. Or that's a personal example. But, you know, we could say, well, dinosaurs existed. And um, I'm not just going to throw that out there with no basis. Why do I believe that? Well, there's evidence. There's fossil evidence that's been recovered through archaeological digs and excavations. So we carbon dated those. We learned that they're very old. We compose them into the skeletal form of the animal. And you can sort of see this is clearly very compelling evidence that dinosaurs existed. So beliefs um, are better when they have evidence to support them. Because the evidence, and this kind of comes back to something you said earlier, Jasmine, evidence gives you better certainty that you're correct. But it's possible for a justified belief to turn out false. It just is less likely. I mean, could it be that the person with the lipstick is just, that's a, there's a benign explanation for that? Or, you know, these messages, it's like a surprise party and they didn't want their partner to know about it. Sure, sometimes evidence can be misinterpreted and sometimes it can be misleading. Take the case where... Um, Someone was framed for a crime that they didn't commit, so evidence was planted so that investigators arriving on the crime scene will come to the wrong conclusion about whoever is guilty. So evidence doesn't necessarily always lead us to the truth, but in most cases it does. Usually evidence is not misleading, but we base our beliefs and decisions on evidence, and we just go with the best evidence that we have. Um, so does that kind of make sense to you guys? Like uh, To have justification means that you could say something reasonable to give evidence uh, support to the claim that you're that you believe is true. Um, is there evidence that's sufficient to have justification for the alien life hypothesis? I don't know. I mean, that's tough. Um, we have a Mars rover up there. It hasn't exactly beamed back any kind of signs of life on Mars. Uh, I guess we don't have a lot of access to widespread part of the universe. But you could say using induction that I mean, human beings exist. Clearly, we do, and we're intelligent. So with a universe as big as this universe is, isn't it possible that there's others? I don't know, I'm just speculating, and I'm trying to get you guys to think a little bit about the concept of justification. It's having reasons for stuff. If you were in a jury trial, this would be the kind of stuff that would have to be presented in the court to make a reasonable case for someone being guilty, or if you're the defense attorney, you try to provide evidence that exonerates the person. Like, you know, you try to show receipts and things that they couldn't have been at the crime scene or that they didn't have that motive. Um, so evidence from whatever source, whether it's perceptual, testimonial, inference-based, etc., that's what we call justification. Okay, now one more piece of vocabulary, and then we can start bringing some of these pieces together to get into the definition of knowledge that's kind of an ancient classic definition. So one more is this, epistemic agent. <clears throat> So an epistemic agent is just a fancy sounding word for a being that is capable, that is even that is even just capable of having beliefs or knowledge. Okay. A being that's capable of having beliefs or knowledge. Okay, so um, there's a lot of beings in the sense that there's objects, things, you know, things that exist, but most of them are not epistemic agents. And when you think about that for a minute, it's kind of, I feel like, is it just me? I feel like that's trippy and like really cool and deep and just weird because like we are these epistemic agents, but we're in a universe where most of the stuff is just inanimate matter, you know? Like, for example, you see this marker? Okay, I think you can see it. Question, based on the definition here on the board, is this an epistemic agent, this marker that you see on the screen? Is it? Is this one of them? 
a being that is capable of having beliefs or of having knowledge? The marker there? Let me ask, and let's see what you think. That's a, kind of an easy one, but we'll take it further. Yeah, it's, so Alicia, I see your answer. It's pretty obvious, right? I hope no one was stumped by that. It's certainly not an epistemic agent, the marker. Even though it's so obvious, I want someone to say, why not? How come you know it's not an epistemic agent, the marker? I mean, how come the marker's not sitting there thinking, wow, cool lecture. Wonder what's going on later I'm gonna have for dinner or wonder what I'll do over spring break. How come it's not having any thoughts or no knowledge, no beliefs? Pretty obvious, but maybe you should say it. What is it? What is this about this thing that's, I mean, you say it's not an epistemic agent. I agree with you, but why not? <clears throat> Can't think, I know, it's not alive. It's not a living thing. It doesn't have any kind of uh, physical structure that would be capable of producing consciousness, right? You need a central nervous system, a brain, you know, um, neurons and all that to be able to process information. So this is an inanimate, non-living object. Therefore, it can't possibly be perceiving things. But are you and I epistemic agents? And there we get a different answer. Yes, we are. We are things that can form beliefs and do have knowledge. There's all kinds of beliefs filling your head right now. You know, if you just think about it, um, you know, you believe that we're the third planet from the sun or you believe that um, of going into history that Columbus came in 1492 to the New World, or you believe that uh, helium is a lighter element on the periodic table than iron. Um, and there's other beliefs that I don't know about you, but like having to do with your life, like the name of your parents or siblings or dog or whatever. So you and I are the kind of things described by this definition, epistemic agents. Um, and so in that sense, we are very unique and fascinating objects in this physical universe. I mean, imagine a universe which I guess, according to science anyway, is how the early universe was, no life yet. In that case, there wouldn't be any epistemic agents. There'd just be a bunch of matter, just be a bunch of stuff, but none of it would be thinking, feeling, experiencing, judging, any of it, just sitting there, just being. Um, so it's kind of cool that we exist as human beings that can talk about the reality that we're a part of and that can actually think about it and take a subjective point on it, not just an, uh, being an object that's part of the furniture of reality. Um, do you think there are other epistemic agents that are not humans? Let me ask you that. This is sort of, what do you think? Non-human epistemic agents? Yay, nay, what is your view? If so, what do you think they are? <clears throat> we know the marker's not one of them, so that is easy enough to write off. But uh, now that we're on this topic, what do you think? Any other uh, epistemic agents that are just not you know, homo sapiens? Alan, you say monkeys? I would agree. Uh, but I don't even think it's just limited to the monkeys, right? I mean, even other non-human animals, a little lower on the chain of life, uh, would, would have the ability to form beliefs and stuff. Now, they might not be very sophisticated. Like, take my cat. You guys see Peach and Eddie coming up here all the time. Um, they're not going to be having knowledge about history. They don't know, like, when the Declaration of Independence was signed. But, I mean, they probably do know very basic things, like when I'm about to feed them or... Um, like they know when I'm present, they know when like a stranger's in the house, because especially Eddie gets very scared and runs away. Um, so like they don't have the kind of detailed knowledge that human beings have, but they've got some rudimentary basic perceptual knowledge at least. You know, humans know how to split an atom and we know the periodic table and you know, we know all about space, and physics. So our knowledge far surpasses that of the other animals, but uh, we could at least compare it to some of them. I don't know how far down the line we could go though. Once we get to like insects, but I don't know. I mean, they at least know when there's danger or when there's a source of food. Um, maybe if we go all the way down to like amoeba and stuff, it's gonna be just total random behavior. But anyway, guys, just food for thought, right? Are there non-human epistemic agents? I would argue yes, but I guess somewhat difficult to verify from the third person point of view. Okay, so anyway, we've covered the vocabulary and now I'm ready to tell you what that classical Greek definition of knowledge is that's going to be just defended here in Plato's writing. So, and this definition of knowledge remained dominant for thousands and thousands of years until randomly 1963 when this American philosopher, which we're going to study when we come back from spring break, Edmund Gettier, he single-handedly revolutionized the whole thinking about knowledge because he basically showed that this classical definition isn't quite right. Nonetheless, though, it's been solid and stable for so long that we still kind of for the most part, refer to it. And this is what they say, knowledge, okay. You've been wondering, what is knowledge according to these classical 
and contemporary epistemologists, knowledge is simply this. It is a justified, justified true belief. Okay, so I had to kind of go through all the terminology first before I could really say this in a way that you'd perfectly understand. But knowledge, they say, combines those three conditions together. It's when you think something's true, so you believe it, and it is true, so you're not just thinking it, but you get it right, so you're correct. Those two pieces are all important. You have to have a belief, but it has to be right. And then third, though, even beyond having a true belief, you also have to have justification to support the true belief. If all three of these pieces are there, if all of the conditions are met, then that is a case of having knowledge. But if even one of the conditions is off, violated, not satisfied, then that makes it not knowledge. Okay, so two out of three, one out of three is not enough. You need all three of these things. Check off all three of those boxes, belief, truth, and justification. And in that case, we've got knowledge. So let me try and at least uh, persuade you of the plausibility, the common sense intuitiveness of the definition. Um, say that you're taking like a multiple choice test and um, you know, it says on the test that it's like a history test. So they're asking you, when did Columbus sail to North America? And they give you four options, A, B, C, D. So it says A, 1492, B, 1692, C, 1892, D, 2025. Now you're that student, okay? And um, suppose that you, you, you eliminate D because you can tell that's the future and in a history class, there's no real discussion of future dates. So you eliminate that one. And, but then you're looking at the other three and you just can't remember. You're like uh, 14, 16, 18, 92, wow, I don't know. So I'm guessing I'm gonna go with B. I think it's 16, 92. Student fills in that bubble, B. Now, this is an easy question, I hope. Tell me, did that student in our case know the answer to the question? Did they know the answer? The question was, what was the year that Columbus sailed? And they filled in B, which said 1692. So is that knowledge or is it not knowledge? It's not knowledge, Jasmine, good. So which conditions being violated in this definition of knowledge? They gave an answer. What's wrong with their answer, which makes it not an example of having knowledge? Because if it has all three of these conditions, then it would be knowledge but it doesn't have all three. Can anybody tell me specifically which criteria has not been satisfied here? They have a belief, they believe it's 1692. So they've got the belief part, but it's not true, that's right. Now Tina, um, let's get into the justification question in a moment, but I was focused on the truth condition for now. That answer they gave is not the correct answer, that's not true. Columbus didn't sail in 1692, he'd been dead already for over 100 years by then because the real date is 1492. So hopefully I'm just trying to inform you that truth is a necessary requirement of having knowledge. If it wasn't, then the teacher would say, hey, you know what? The answer is not true, but it's still knowledge because everything's knowledge. Whether it's true, false, or anything, we just credit everything as knowledge. No. We only give credit for knowledge when the information that you believe is the correct fact. And so in the case I'm mentioning here, we write in the wrong answer. You don't get marked for credit because credit requires knowledge and knowledge requires correctness and truth, okay? So that's why that student didn't know the answer. Let's go to another variation on the case, okay? Say that the student sees the questions and now we have a different student and the student is thinking this, oh, I'm really bad with dates, I know it's not D's, so that's easy enough. And I think it can't be C because 1892 is pretty recent. So I've narrowed it down to A or B, 1492 or 1692. Man, I have no idea which one it is. I'm just guessing right now. But I guess as long as I'm guessing, I'll just go with 1492 uh, because my little brother's 14 and that's like my lucky number. So I'll just do that. Now, they filled in A. Did that student know the answer? They got it right. But did they really know it? What do you think? The guessing student. The student that did write in the correct answer. I guess the, they filled the right bubble. But was it based on knowledge? Do they know the answer, really? What do you think is the best way to say this? Yeah, they didn't know it, and now, Tina, maybe we can get into your previous suggestion. 
since this is not really knowledge, I mean, it's a correct answer, but there's a difference between this kind of correct answer a student gives and another student who really knows that answer. Okay, so what's the difference between the student who fills it in full of confidence, like, I would have done this 100 out of 100 times, no way is it any other answer, versus the student that's like, I don't know, it's a random last second guess and I'm just going with a hunch. What's missing that makes our student here, the guessing correct student, still not have knowledge? Well, what's the missing or violated criteria now? What do you think? Because it is a true answer, and it, but it's not justified. There you go, Tina. If you ask this person, why is that the right answer? They wouldn't be able to give you reasons. They wouldn't be able to say, well, it's the right answer because as we all know, Columbus was born in the 15th century. And as we all know, the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria were constructed by this particular company at this particular time. So a student that could say all these reasons as the basis for their answer would be someone who really knows it. The other student getting a lucky guess didn't really know it. They just happened to have the correct response. So knowledge requires more than just lucky guesses. If I stand here before you today and I say, I think there's aliens in outer space, do you think I have knowledge of that claim? I don't have knowledge. It could be true. If it is true, then I have a true belief, but I don't have knowledge because I need better evidence. Uh, so, you know, if the Mars rover does start beaming back, you know, video or photos of little life forms on the surface of Mars, then we would say this is no longer speculation. It's something that we just know because the evidence is obvious and it indicates that it's true. Um, so without having justification, the best you can have is a lucky guess. And lucky guesses are, I guess, nice because they're correct by definition, but they're unreliable and uh, they're not the same thing as knowledge. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll just throw one more of those out there at you. Right now, this, um, let's take the population of the United States. How many total United States citizens exist right now? Well. Is it an odd number or an even number? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you this, it's gotta be one of the two because every whole number is either an even or an odd number. So suppose I'm a person who just loves even numbers, you know, for whatever reason. And so I just choose to believe this, that right now there's an even number of US citizens. Um, could I be correct? Well, 50-50, I have a chance to be correct. But even if I'm correct, can you say that I know that right now? It's not knowledge because it's just based on the inference that the number has to be even or odd, but I have no specific evidence that indicates that it actually is even. What would give me that knowledge would be if I did a census or something, and then post census, I could identify the number of heads I've counted. Then I could see if it's divisible by two, and at that point it would be knowledge. But right now, before having done any of that investigation, I'm providing a belief that has a chance of being true, but it couldn't be knowledge unless I had better evidence to support it. Okay, so what we've done today is just some important things. We talked about changing onto this new topic of epistemology, the study of knowledge. I told you that the ancient Greeks were the first to really discuss the concept, and so we learned a little bit about the history of uh, Socrates and Plato, who was his student. Um, then I wanted to tell you guys some information about vocabulary that's basic and fundamental in epistemology. And after we learned all those epistemology vocabulary terms, we we're able to put some of them together so that you could see this definition of knowledge. This definition, the one that I'm explaining to you now, is the one that is found in those ancient Greek writings. And it's the one that remained in, uh, solid and stable for literally thousands of years until 1963. So um, when we return from our spring break, that you know, now we're gonna have a nice time off, we'll finish this last piece of uh, the Platonic dialogue on the Nino, and then we'll also learn about the criticism of it that Edmund Gettier wrote in 1963. So you'll learn how uh, Socrates defines knowledge and how Plato defines knowledge, and then how thousands of years later, um, people you know, came up with a different explanation. Oh, thanks, Jasmine. So back to Socrates' quote. He said, uh, I know that I know nothing, and that makes me the wisest of all. So there's a, there's a sort of myth and a legend about Socrates, actually. There was this uh, um, oracle at Delphi. Delphi is another part of, of Greece, okay? And back then, you know how today we have people that say, oh, I'm a crystal ball reader, come get your psychic prediction from me, or I'm a tarot card reader, or I read your palms, right? So cultural superstitions and stuff based on kind of pseudoscience. But anyway, in the same kind of concept, back in ancient Greece, people believed that some individuals that were born blind had special powers and properties to like see the 
underworld and communicate with the gods. And they would call sometimes these people blind seers. It's an uh, oxymoronic term, but they thought that being blind physically enabled greater powers of communication and perception with the supernatural. So one of those blind seers was this oracle they called her at Delphi. And Socrates went to speak to the oracle. And this oracle said to Socrates, Socrates, you're the wisest man in all of Athens. And that's all that it said. And he was so puzzled by this because he thought afterwards, how can it be saying I'm the wisest man? I mean, me of all people have the most doubt of anyone that I know things. He, he kept saying that. He's like, of all people, I'm the least bold. And, you know, I have the least like swagger saying like, oh, I know everything. He's so humble. He says, I just ask questions. I just want to learn from people. I never make firm conclusions. And I say I know nothing. And so he started to think more deeply about it. And after a while, he realized that that was the hidden message of the oracle. You're the wisest man in Athens because you're the only one who knows that you don't know anything. And everybody else thinks that they know something, which they don't. So they're, they don't know anything. And you know at least one thing, which is that you know nothing. So it's almost like his humility and his willingness to just pursue knowledge instead of like kind of overconfidently claim that he had it. He thought that that was the hidden message of the oracle, which actually qualified him to be this master philosopher because he's always questioning, always seeking knowledge that he thinks he doesn't have. Um, so does that help you, Jasmine, a little bit? There is there is a little bit of a story behind that quote. Um, he's the wisest of all because he knows that he knows nothing. And he based the assessment on the, the statement that the oracle gave to him. And he had to think for a while about how that could possibly be true because uh, he never said he knows anything. And to the contrary, he always says he knows nothing. So he realized that that's what makes him the wisest person because all the others all think they know stuff. And that makes them just egotistical and vain. He's the one and only person who knows at least this much, that there's knowledge that he doesn't have. So it's a little bit of a catch-22, but it's an interesting story, too. Um, is epistemology the reason why I don't get multiple choice exams? Well, I think that in philosophy, if you're able to guess an answer and get credit for it, but you don't really know what you're saying, then it is fundamentally not right. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it makes it a little harder for you. But in the end, life um, and the value that you're going to get out of your life has so much more to do with your knowledge and your depth of experience than how you do in one particular question. So I think that it's well served to the students. Um, but yeah, it's, I just don't believe it's good for a person to be able to fill in something, get credit, but they didn't know it. If you don't know it, you should get no credit. You should have to prove that you know it. Um, so that's one of the reasons I do think, yeah, I agree with that. But anyway, guys, thanks so much. I don't want to hold you too late. I know we've had a few extra moments here after two, sorry, 345, but uh, I'll be in touch with everyone. I'm working on your, you know, midterms, and I'll be continuing to grade them through the break. If there's anything you need from me, though, uh, feel free to email me anytime, and I'll be checking that uh, regularly. Okay, guys, so thanks again. Have a good one, and um, take care. I'll see you after we get back from spring break. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.